Good morning. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. My name is Alistair Wilson. I'm one of the tax partners here at MHA Tate Walker and today we are doing a webinar on Brexit, importing and exporting, but focusing both on what would be the impact for businesses across the north of England and in Northern Ireland in particular. Um, it's going to cover both importing and exporting into the EU, but also importantly what's happening with Northern Ireland and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, this is something which is now becoming very important for clients across the UK and hopefully for many people today it'll give a level of understanding as to what's important and why. Um, we're going to use a, a method just where I say please move the slides on where that needs to be done. So Sam if we're able to move on to the first slide. So in terms of housekeeping there will be a Q&A session at the end of this webinar. Now this webinar is very well attended today. There are more than 100 attendees. We have had a lot of questions in advance. We are expecting there to be a lot more questions as we go along. There is a chat function on Teams Live. There is a speech bubble icon that you'll be able to see in your control bar and you can use that to submit any questions. Um, bearing or in view of the number of questions that we expect that we may get, in reality what we may do is answer questions one to one with individuals offline. Now if you're logging in from Northern Ireland it is likely that one of the members of the team from Baker Tilly Mooney Moor will be in touch with you. If you're logging in from the north of England, it's likely to be somebody from MHA Tate Walker. Um, so please do submit your questions. We will make sure that they get answered, but in view of the questions, we may find that we can't cover them all in the Q&A session at the end. If you are submitting a question, if you've logged in anonymously, we may say, can you please submit your email address as well, just so that we know who to contact. Sam, if we can move on. And in terms of your speakers today, you've got myself doing the introduction. I'm a tax partner at MHA Tate Walker. We've got Hadim Sultan, who's our head of indirect tax here at MHA Tate Walker. I'm delighted to be joined by Angela Keary, who is a senior manager from Baker Tilly Mooney Moor in Belfast. And Angela will be covering the view from Northern Ireland and why it may impact businesses in the north of England as well as in Northern Ireland. And then finally, we'll have Andrew Fitton, who's a corporate tax director here at MHA Tate Walker, and he'll be covering some other aspects to remember. Sam, if we can move on. So as I say, the purpose of this webinar is that the government are now rightly concerned that businesses are not prepared for Brexit. We've been having a lot of conversations with businesses across the north of England, and the feedback is that businesses aren't aware of some of the issues that they should be thinking about. This webinar is intended to raise some of the key aspects which apply deal or no deal. In reality, what the position is will depend on your individual business. So this is generic. We are very happy to have one to one conversations to look at what are the individual issues for your business. We have been doing lots of this recently and we have yet to find a single business that has got everything covered. So if you come away from this thinking you've got a lot to do, don't worry. Lots of businesses are in the same place. If we can move on, Sam. And in terms of where are we now? Well, obviously we know that trade talks are still ongoing. Obviously we know that the intention is to try and reach a deal with the EU, but the, both the government and the authorities in the EU are suggesting prepare for no deal. Why? Well, is that simply a negotiation process? Well, if you prepare for the worst case and that is what actually happens, then you can't go wrong. We can move on, Sam. And why this is important. Now, this is a big change for businesses. And I am deliberately using the phrase Great Britain here. Now, Great Britain will effectively have customs borders with mainland Europe, the Republic of Ireland, and also Northern Ireland. This has not been the case since the free movement of goods was brought in the single market back in 1992. Um, a border, a customs border with Northern Ireland has never been an issue. So many businesses have never had to deal with customs as a, as a significant business issue. They do now, but this is something that has, is new for most businesses. And as a result, there are lots of things that need to be done. We can move on, Sam. 
And this slide is intended just to try and provide an overview. This is to try and set out that for many businesses, they may be acting as both an exporter of goods, but depending on when they lose responsibility for those goods, they may also be acting as an importer of those same goods. And so businesses need to look at both sides of the border. What, what happens to those goods? When do they lose responsibilities for those goods? What declarations need to be made? Who's making them? What other declarations may be needed in terms of particular goods? But one of the things we've highlighted in particular is EORI numbers. Now the government issued EORI numbers about 12 months ago to lots of businesses. What many businesses don't realize is that those EORI numbers will not cover a lot of the activities that will be carried out. And we'll come on to that in more detail. We can move on, Sam. So in reality, this presentation is about checking that you are ready for what will happen on both sides of that customs border. As you'll see, that, that might be a customs border that's in the Irish Sea, or it might be a border that's in Europe. But what you need to do as a business owner is to understand where your responsibilities start and finish. And are you ready to deal with the declarations or the administration or the paperwork or the costs that will result from that? We can move on to my final slide, Sam. And ultimately, what are we trying to do? We're trying to highlight the businesses that the government are right. Lots of businesses aren't prepared. And that's partly down to what is happening in terms of the politics of all of this and how long it's taking. But paperwork being overlooked will cause goods to get stuck or delayed at borders. And that's simply because some housekeeping hasn't taken place. And even today, the haulage associations are saying that some of the guides that are needed aren't going to be issued until December. So actually understanding what is needed, it's very difficult to get some of the answers, but all businesses will be able to check have they got the basic housekeeping in place. And so what we're recommending now is that housekeeping is urgent and businesses should move on with getting prepared themselves. And at this point, I'm going to head, hand over to Hadim Sultan, who is our head of our indirect tax practice. Hi, hi, good afternoon, everyone. So I lead the VAT practice here at MHA Tate Walker. What I'm going to run you through is the overview of the key VAT and customs changes and the key steps that business needed to undertake to get Brexit ready. This is for a no deal Brexit. Just to mention that there's a lot to cover here and we will not be to go into a great detail on all the points, but what we are offering to our clients is a one to one kind of session where we can go through your individual circumstances and get you a bespoke kind of Brexit action plan in place. So if you're not already signed up for one of those, I'd, hi I'd highly recommend that you do sign up for one of those. So as Alistair's mentioned, kind of we're now going to be leaving the single market. And a big change is going to be that there are going to be different rules for Northern Ireland and Great Britain. So I'll just be covering off the Great Britain element and my colleague Angela Kiu will cover off Northern Ireland. So what we're going to physically have from the 1st of January is a customs border between Great Britain and the EU. So imports of goods coming from the EU will be treated like other imports from the rest of the world. There's going to be a requirement to do customs declarations. A very big change is now customs duties will be due on goods coming in from the EU. Now we've left the EU, the UK government has set their own set of tariffs. So that's called the UK Global Tariff and you can find that on .gov.uk and there's a link in this presentation. If you need any assistance working out what the tariff might be, then please do get in touch. On the export side, there's going to be export controls. So you'll need to go do export declarations to get goods out of the UK. And when those goods land in the EU, there's going to be EU import declarations required and additional tariffs, and they are WTO uh, rate tariffs. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just a kind of summary overview of what you can expect from the 1st of January. Well, invariably, businesses are going to have to get used to new processes that they've never had to deal with before. There's going to be far more paperwork. Failures with paperwork invariably are going to lead to delay and we are anticipating delays from the 1st of January, as is the government. And 
one of the big things that's going to happen is the imposition of customs duties. Customs duties are very different to VAT. You can't recover customs duty, so they're an absolute cost. Now, if you're trading with a customer in the EU and you've got a 5% profit margin, if you add on top of that a 10% uh, customs duty, you've gone from making a profit to making a loss. So it is incredibly important, the imposition of customs duties. One of the things that's going to happen as well with increased administration, more requirements, there are going to be admin costs for yourselves. And if you're using a freight forwarder, they are going to have to do more work. So invariably, they're going to charge you more for doing that work. With any big change as well, you're going to have to look at your IT. So is your IT ready to record the information you need, for instance, for export declarations? Is it ready to do your VAT returns in a post Brexit world? So you may need to have a conversation with your software supplier. So this is kind of just a, an overview of the kind of key bits of changes. What we're going to do is go over some of the, the more detailed changes next. Next slide, please. So the big thing is we're now going to have a customs border between Great Britain and the EU. The good news for most businesses is that a full border won't be in place from the 1st of January. Only businesses that are importing controlled goods are required to do full import declarations and pay customs duties on the 1st of January. The government's produced a list of controlled goods. So these are things like goods that are subject to excise duty, alcohol, tobacco, cigarettes, and goods that are potentially hazardous. So things like uh, fireworks, firearms, and certain medicines. There is a list, the government has produced a list, so it's definitely worth checking to see whether the goods you import are on that list. Now, if your goods aren't on that list, the businesses are being allowed to defer import declarations till the end of June next year. Once you've submitted your declaration, then you can pay customs duty. So effectively, you're getting a deferral on the paperwork and a deferral on payment. So businesses should take advantage of that, whereas uh, beneficial to you. The bad news is from the 1st of July 2021, 20, we're going to have full import controlled and businesses need to get themselves fully geared up for being fully ready to do that from the 1st of July. Uh, next slide, please. As well as customs duty being payable on goods coming from the EU, import VAT is now also going to be payable on goods coming from the EU. If you're currently exporting, you'll be used to some of the current rules. There will be a new set of rules coming in around how you deal with import VAT. So at the moment, what you have to do is physically pay VAT, import VAT at the border or a little bit later on if you've got a deferment account. And then you recover that through your VAT return when you get your C79 certificate. So there's an inherent two, potentially two to three month delay, cash flow delay. What the government is going to do to alleviate that is allow businesses now to use postponed VAT accounting, which means you can account for import VAT entirely through your VAT return. So it's going to be a much like the reverse charge. You charge yourself the VAT, import VAT, and recover it on the same VAT return. So that's going to be a good change for many businesses. And it also applies to imports from the rest of the world. So it is a, is a positive development. Uh, next slide, please. And on the export side, we kind of mentioned kind of a lot of this already. If you're sending goods out of the EU, you will be to the, of the UK, you'll need it to fill in export declarations. To do that, you'll need a GB EORI number. If you're responsible for importation into the EU or exportation out of the EU, you will need a separate EU EORI number. And I'm going to cover that in a bit more detail in a later slide. If you're sending goods to the EU and you're responsible for importation and you're responsible for that side of it, you, you've got to bear in mind that WTO tariffs will apply to those goods in the event of a no deal. Next slide, please. And some other changes as well. I'm not going to go through these in too much detail. If you're impacted, please do get in touch. One of the things that's going to change as we're no longer a member of the EU, GB businesses can't benefit from EU simplifications. So this is things like triangulation, call off stock, mini one-stop shop. Most of these are designed to avoid a business having to 
of VAT register in another EU member state. Once we leave the EU, potentially you're going to have a VAT registration obligation in another EU member state, or potentially your supplier, if you're using something like call-off stock, is going to have a VAT registration obligation in the UK, which is going to be a big change for a number of businesses. Uh, the UK is going to get rid of low value consignment relief and there is a change to how that will be dealt with. There's going to be a change to how you get refunds of VAT from other member states. If you're impacted by that, do get in touch. If you're a business that's got a VAT registration in another EU member state, from the 1st of January, you may need to appoint a local fiscal representative to deal with your customs and VAT affairs. Some member states don't allow non-EU members to do their own filings, etc. So you do need to check on that. A practical point is currently businesses that sell goods to the EU fill in EC sales lists. They're going from the 1st of January, so that's a administrative benefit. Businesses do still, however, need a complete interest stat. So this is just a summary of kind of the, the, the key changes. What we're going to go on to now is some of the key practical things that businesses need to think about. Uh, next slide, please. So of absolute critical importance is commodity codes. So commodity codes are a way to classify goods and they're also the thing that determines what rate of duty applies to those goods. Businesses that have only really dealt with the EU may not be familiar with commodity codes, but they're going to have to get very familiar with these because it's absolutely critical they know what duty they are having to pay on goods and how that kind of impacts their profitability. Uh, next slide, please. EORI numbers. So at the moment, there's one single EORI number across the EU. Businesses that we spoke to said, great, we've got our GB EORI number, we're sorted. What we've had to do is say, well, actually, no, the GB EORI only works from the 1st of January in the UK, so Great Britain. So that'll only cover goods coming into or out of Great Britain. If you're dealing with imports and exports on the EU side, you'll need to apply for a European EORI, so one issued by an EU member state. What we're saying to businesses now is that you can apply in some member states for a provisional EORI number. Get that now. If you're not sure whether you're going to import on the 1st of January, get that in place now because it's better to have it and not need it than to need it and not have it because the last thing you want to do is on the 1st of January, have your goods held up for like 5, 10, 15 days or however long it takes for you to get that EORI number. So if you're doing anything in, in Europe, get that EORI number and we can help you get that. So just get in touch. Not content with just having two EORI numbers, there's now also a third EORI number for Northern Ireland. I'm not going to give too many spoilers away, so I'll let Angela cover off the, the, the Northern Ireland EORI requirements. Uh, next slide, please. Rules of origin is going to become very important post Brexit. So if we start doing trade deals with the rest of the world, so the US, for instance, the, where goods come from often determines whether they get a preferential rate of customs duty. Now, businesses need to think about the provenance of their goods and fully understand whether their goods do meet the rules of origin test. So is enough of it manufactured in the UK? Is there enough work done in the UK to get those uh, preferential rates? Very, very important for manufacturers, particularly in the automotive sector. Uh, next slide, please. And this is kind of the biggest area we've been having conversations with our clients around. Do they fully understand their supply chain? And we found that not many of our businesses have fully explored their entire supply chain. So what you're looking at there is, is there potentially going to be a delay on the 1st of January? and how will you deal with that? So unlike COVID with toilet rolls, we are here saying, look, it's definitely better for you to start stockpiling because you don't want to be in a position where you're holding up trade because you haven't got the goods that you need. It's also critical because we've been having conversations with clients and they've said, I don't get anything from EU suppliers, so I'm fine. Well, actually that's not necessarily the case. Your UK supplier, they might have their own supply chain which involves the EU. So you're gonna to have to have a conversation with them and say, look, is there potentially any delays going to happen for us? And how will that impact us? Another critical thing businesses need to do is analyze their contractual terms. So with customs, you now being a hard cost, 
you need to be absolutely certain who bears that cost. And if you're bearing that cost, is there a way that you can kind of pass that cost onto your customer? And uh, next slide, please. So one of the key, key ways of identifying what your obligations are is INCO terms. So when you trade internationally, there's a set of INCO terms, there's 11 of them, and they essentially set out what the responsibilities of the buyer are and what the responsibilities of the seller are. So at the one end, we've got X works where the seller has very little obligations to the other end of the spectrum where we've got duty delivered paid, where the seller is responsible for all elements of it. So this includes insurance, loading and loading, and importantly, export declarations, import declarations, and paying import duty. It's their cost. What we found is many businesses have not looked at their contracts with their customers with a post-Brexit kind of lens. So some of the things have never been written and Brexit was never contemplated. So they may potentially be on the hook for customs duty charges, which will impact their bottom line. So you need to check and review all your kind of contractual terms and particularly your INCO terms to determine where you sit. And I just wanted to cover off X work and duty deliver paid in a bit more detail. Uh, next slide, please. So if you're trading X works, so this means your responsibility is just to get the goods ready and your customer takes those away from your warehouse. They're involved, they're responsible for the exportation. They're responsible for importing that into, for in this example, Spain, and they're responsible for paying import VAT and customs duty in Spain. Now that's great if you're a seller. However, we have a number of customers or clients who are the buyer in the scenario. So they're buying X works from the EU. Now all of those obligations now become theirs. They're responsible for the export side of it. They're responsible for the importation side and duties. As you can see, it makes a big difference whether you're a buyer or seller and whether you're trading on X works terms. And next slide, please. And duty delivered paid is the mirror opposite of X works. This is where you have the maximum obligations as the seller. So as the seller, you're responsible for everything to the customer's doorstep, including customs duties. Before Brexit, it, there were no customs duties. So now having that responsibility is very, very onerous. And also there's a potential there to trigger VAT registration obligations across the EU. If you're the buyer, this is good for you because you're not involved in any of that side. So as you can see from these, it makes a big difference whether you're X works, D, DP, and whether you're a buyer or seller. And I think a lot of businesses will want to pass the costs on to their customer or they'll want their customer or supplier to deal with their thing. So there's going to be potentially a need for a lot of negotiations to kind of determine what you're happy to kind of accept in terms of your own obligations. And next slide, please. So we've obviously painted a bit of a picture there that potentially you're going to be responsible for paying lots of customs duty and this might become a significant hard cost to you or you might be having to do lots of additional administration. There are however some customs procedures that might help you kind of minimize your duty cost or help you kind of minimize the amount of paperwork you need to do. I'm not going to go into any great detail on these. If some businesses have these already, so if you've already have these in place, they'll still be you you'll still be able to use these kind of post Brexit. But I just wanted to flag a particular one that we're kind of discussing with a lot with our clients, which is inward processing relief. Inward processing relief allows you to bring goods into the UK with duty suspended, and if for those goods that are intended to be exported out of the UK after processing you won't have to pay duty. So you're not getting a duty hit if you're bringing in goods that you know are going for export. Now that is very, very important for some of our clients to try and get that in place so they are not suffering, say, 5, 10, 15%, whatever the duty rate is on their goods. Just want to bear in mind, obviously, Brexit's fairly kind of looming fairly closely. Some of these special customs procedures take some time to get in place, so it may take 30 days for HMRC degree, or in some instances, two to three months to, to kind of get agreed. So if you think that you are likely to have a significant customs duty kind of impact now, once you've looked at your commodity codes, get in touch and get the ball rolling on getting those in place because you want to get those in as soon as possible. 
if you're going to take some of the responsibility for doing customs declarations and uh, rather than using an agent, there is some HMRC grants available for training, software improvements and uh, recruitment of a custom specialist. If you're thinking of doing it yourself, do get in touch. We can kind of set out some of the uh, government funding that might be available to assist. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just a summary slide, just of kind of the key things we think you need to do right now. So the first thing you need to do is obviously make sure you've got all the EORE numbers you need. You're not, you may not just need that GB EORE number. Fully analyze your supply chain and the impact on pricing, the impact of any sort of delays and stockpile if you need to. Review all of your contract terms and in particular your INCO terms to, so you know exactly what you are responsible for and so your customers and your suppliers know exactly what they're responsible for. Don't forget UK uh, suppliers in that. On the customs duty side, if you're going to do it yourself, make sure you've got the capability to do it in-house. If you're going to appoint an agent to do this for you, get that agent now because they're going to be incredibly busy uh, in, the, in the coming months. And finally, have a look at the impact of trading with Northern Ireland. And this is a good segue to kind of hand over to my colleague Angela, who will go through their, those impacts. Thank you. Thanks, Hadim. So just to introduce myself, my name is Angela Carey. I'm head of tax in Bicatilly Minimur in Belfast. And I want to thank Alistair and the team for the opportunity to come along and talk today about trade with Northern Ireland um, uh, post Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Trade with Northern Ireland come 1st of January is going to be very different than it is now, and that is due to the Northern Ireland Protocol. So the Northern Ireland Protocol was a piece of legislation that came in um, into play as part of the withdrawal agreement, um, and it sets out how Northern Ireland will trade with the EU and with GB. Um, it's the, the purpose of the Northern Ireland Protocol really is to protect the Good Friday Agreement and protect trade on the island of Ireland, between the north and south of Ireland. But what that does mean is that we now have effectively a border between Northern Ireland and the rest of the UK, or as I'll refer to GB. So the first implication is around um, goods moving from Northern Ireland to GB. Um, and, and what the protocol says is that goods should move as they do now. So it talks about Northern Ireland um, goods moving with unfettered access and with free movement. The, the side issue with this and where, where it affects you guys and GB in particular is um, the, the it originally talked about Northern Ireland goods. It then went on to talk about Northern Ireland businesses having that free movement and unfettered access. And then it simply talked about goods moving from Northern Ireland to GB. So if you think about that from a, from a wider viewpoint, we could have had a position where Northern Ireland was effectively a back door into the UK um, so that businesses in the EU could, for example, route their goods through Northern Ireland and on into the UK without any documentation, without any tariffs, etc. That issue didn't seem to have been picked up by the UK government for quite a while. And in fact, that's part of the, the controversy on the internal markets bill. Um, they're trying to not have to complete exit declarations on goods moving from Northern Ireland to GB, but we just need to watch and see what happens with that. What they have said is that to, to have unfettered access and free movement on goods moving from Northern Ireland to GB, they need to be a qualifying product. Um, and they've just defined that as a qualifying product present in Northern Ireland that is not subject to any customs supervision restrictions or control. So still a very wide definition. How long do they have to be present in Northern Ireland? Who has to own the goods, etc.? What they have also said, however, is that they will defi that definition will be refined over time and that if necessary, they will bring in separate legislation and they will bring in separate legislation and potentially before the 31st of December, if they view it, uh, if they take the view that people will be inappropriately rerouting goods in order to avoid otherwise applicable import formalities and, and tariffs. So where they think that, that this open border, if you like, uh, and being able to send goods freely from Northern Ireland to GB is being exploited or being used by EU businesses that otherwise would have a tariff, then they are likely to bring in more controls, uh, more declarations and, and more documentation around that. But we just need to wait and see. Can we have the next slide, please? Thank you, Sam. Um, so the main implication is around goods moving from GB to Northern Ireland. Um, 
goods moving to GB to Northern Ireland will be very different come the 1st of January 2021. And a lot of this is regardless of whether or not there's a deal put in place. So the first point there, border inspection posts at ports and harbours. That applies in particular to food and agri businesses, psychosanitary businesses, businesses where they require actually regulatory checks on the goods. So they will require an inspection um, on the GB side before they leave GB, and they will also require an inspection and an export health check, for example, whenever they arrive in Northern Ireland. Um, the legislation says that those checks will be carried out at our posts and harbours. I can tell you that that infrastructure has not yet been built. Um, in fact, they haven't even reached agreement on what it will look like. I understand that those declarations or health checks aren't in place, never mind the people to do them. So there's a whole there's a whole piece still to be agreed in terms of how those inspection um, will inspections will happen. Um, but also from your from from a GB business perspective, you need to think about the cost of it. So I mean, I've been led to believe that, for example, one export health check could be fifty pounds, and one product could require more than one export health check. And an example I've used several times is a pizza, which will ha could have ham, cheese, eggs, chicken, etc. on it, all from animal products, all requiring different export health checks. Um, and that's why we're starting to see a lot of food businesses in GB say that they actually will not continue to sell or, or trade with NI come the 1st of January. So hopefully these are issues that can be addressed. The food business um, have other issues around labelling, for example. So we now know that businesses that prepackaged food coming into Northern Ireland from GB post the 1st of January has to have a food business operator address in Northern Ireland um, on the label, which is also causing an issue. And there are some regulatory issues as well in terms of just the ability to trade between GB and NI. So the first point of call is obviously to check that you can continue to trade. Once you've got past that point uh, and considered whether you're going to have any of these export health checks or additional checks because you're in food or sector sanitary wire, then you need to look at the other implications. So the first one is that all goods moving from GB to NI will require a customs declaration. They will also require a safety and security declaration and EU tariffs, so the EU common tariff may be payable if the goods that are moving from GB to NI are deemed at risk of moving to the EU. This point of what is what which goods are deemed at risk of moving to the EU is still to be determined and it's been decided by the Joint Committee. So if you think the UK government will take a view that uh, no goods are at risk of moving to the EU, that move into NI and therefore no tariffs are payable, the EU has a very much a view that there's a risk of all goods moving to the EU and therefore the EU tariff is payable. And what they have said is then that there'll be the potential to claim a refund if you can prove that those goods don't move to the EU. The previous advice, the previous indications were that they were going to judge goods at risk of moving to the EU based on the commodity code. So if your product, um, if your product was a component part, for example, or an ingredient that could be used in other uh, other products, then there was no control over where that would end up. So that would always be at risk of moving to the EU or where the EU common tariff was high in comparison with the UK global tariff. Um, that that would be, be, be sorry that would be a product deemed to be at risk of moving to the EU. The reason being that otherwise that, that could be used again using Northern Ireland as a route to get it into the EU, you know, um, could be a saving. We now believe that actually that's going to be on a much more individualised basis um, on each kind of shipment that comes over into NI, and you will ask to be proved prove on each um, import whether those goods are actually at risk of moving to the EU and if they are that EU common tariff will have to be paid. Now the tariff will only have to be paid if it's a no deal scenario but the customs declaration and the safety and security declaration have to be completed regardless. Um, there are VAT considerations around that which we will come on to. Um, I think one of the important points here, um, Hadeem has talked about inco terms. There really are no income terms in place between GB businesses and Northern Ireland businesses. There have been no need for them in the past. So it's not clear um, in many cases when ownership of the goods changes and who would be responsible for the declarations and paying the tariffs if applicable. Um, and certainly we can see issues around it. So if the GB exporter is deemed to be the Northern Ireland importer and has to pay the tariff, 
they will not be in a position to reclaim it because they will not be able to prove what happened to the goods on down the line. So there are some practical issues around that still to be worked out. The good news on all of this is that the government have provided and set up the Trader Support Service. Um, and this is a service whereby they've put £350 million pounds, um, to run it for a period of two years. This trader support service will complete the customs declarations on your behalf, so you don't need to gauge a customs agent for trade going from GB to NI. They will arrange for payment of the tariff if it's applicable. They will arrange for repayment of the tariff if you can prove that the goods um, didn't leave the UK. Uh, and they will also have sort of an advisory service alongside that. Um, can I have the next slide, please? OK, so, so I've just put up a screenshot of the Trader Support Service. Um, I would encourage all businesses um, who are sending any goods from GB to NI to go onto this site and to register um, under the Trader Support Service for several reasons. One is that they have valuable training, so there's training on there that you can do. They have said that if you register, they would keep you up to date um, with information as it comes out. Some of the practicalities are not yet known in terms of how this will operate. Um, we know that it's a consortium that are now running the Trader Support Service and the, the customs agent that are part of that service are likely to gather lots of information in advance. So they're going to want to know all of your details of the products that you're moving, the commodity codes of, of the products that you're moving, so that they have that information to hand. And that information that you supply in advance, together with the information that will be on the safety and security declaration, which GB exporters will have to will have to prepare, should allow them to complete that customs declaration on your behalf. The other point Heidi has mentioned is around the EOA numbers. So businesses trading with Northern Ireland will need a new EOA number come the 1st of January 2021. And that's because Northern Ireland effectively sits uh, as still part of the UK, but within the EU customs system. Um, if you register under that trader support service by the 23rd of November, they have said they will make sure you automatically get the, the new XIEO number that you need. Otherwise, you'll have to go through a separate application process. So really, I can't stress strongly enough how important it is to register for trader support service. Even if you aren't sure that you need it, I would suggest registering for it, getting the XI number and following, following that page and following the training that they put out. Next slide, please. OK, and finally, just to look at the VAP implications then. So um, strictly speaking, UK is deemed to be a third country for VAP purposes post the 1st of January 2021. And Northern Ireland has to follow EU VAT rules in addition to being part of the EU single market. So I think how they solve the VAT problem for Northern Ireland um, ha has been one of the big issues. Uh, we originally thought businesses in Northern Ireland would get a different VAT number and you might need to have a separate VAT registration. We've now, they've now clarified that that isn't the case. So what they have said is that they continue to account for all sales across the UK through your single VAT return. So whether you are a Northern Ireland business or a UK business that are UK VAT registered, you will still use that one VAT return. You will account for VAT as it is now on sales to GB um, and businesses in GB will account for VAT as it is now on sales to NI. Um, the only changes are around um, moving your own goods, VAT groups and the margin scheme. So if you are a business in GB that is moving goods to UNI, so for example, you have a, a depot in Bristol and you're moving goods to your depot in Belfast, post 1st of January, you will need to account for VAT on the movement of those goods. So that will be output VAT on your VAT return and provided you're using them for value purpose in Belfast, you can then claim it as input VAT as well. So it will be an in and out on the VAT return. Of course, you need to think um, about partial exemption there. So if you're a business that has to apply a partial exemption method, that could have implications for you. VAT groups with UK VAT groups, it's a similar situation. So normally whenever goods move within a UK VAT group, there's a disregard um, for VAT purposes and nothing has to be done. Again, even if you're in a UK VAT group and the goods are moving from GB to NI, you will need to account for, for VAT in the movement of those goods. So the output VAT on the value of the goods moving. As Heidi has already said, the, the intra-EU simplifications aren't available for GB. And the last piece of that is around the margin scheme, which really applies to Northern Ireland businesses. But just to say very quickly that um, Northern Ireland businesses that would buy goods in GB under the margin scheme, the biggest example being second-hand cars, 
um, will not be able to use the monitoring scheme when they sell them in Northern Ireland um, and that will have a real impact for some Northern Ireland businesses going forward. With that, I'll hand back to Andrew. Thanks very, Thanks much, very much, Andrew. Much. I'd like to I'd make like some, to observations some observations about, about the... Uh, the uh, sorry, I've got a bit of echo on this. Uh, we'd we'll like, like to make some other, other observations around um, Brexit because we've talked a lot about VAT and customs at the moment, but there are um, perhaps other points that we're coming across quite frequently. Can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. Picking up on a point Angela made, um, you may need additional certifications, licenses, and, and particularly labelling for goods passing between the UK and the EU. Someone very kindly asked a question in advance of this presentation regarding CE labelling. And I don't know how many of you are aware that we will not have CE labelling, which is the labelling which effectively has conformity to European standards. In the UK, we'll have CAUK labelling uh, going forward into 2021. So you, you, in, in terms of products and, and labelling, you know, that is something I think is very important to check. Really very important indeed. Um, we'll include a link to the um, UK Gov website in respect of CA UK labelling um, as part of this presentation. And I would suggest you look at it if that's at all important to you. The CE website doesn't, doesn't I think, when the last time I looked, have up to date information on it. Another thing to check in respect of products and uh, is and tenders for that matter as well is do, do do your contracts and tenders require you to be EU resident to actually deliver those contracts? Because if they do, then that might require a EU affiliate to be set up, or it may require you to find if you're part of a multinational group, find a, a, a sort of a, a friendly affiliate that already exists to enable you to service that contract. Um, that could take a little time, obviously. Um, so it's worth going through your contracts and your tenders to determine whether any require you to be EU resident to deliver them. And that might be the case in respect of um, tenders that ultimately end up with the, the EU itself um, or that, we, you know, require something for goods of origin and so on and so forth. Thanks. So Next slide. OK, I'll just move past those questions because I appreciate we're running quite short of time. Next slide. Thank you. So other changes that are not product related that I just want to draw um, everyone's attention to. So do you hire non-domiciled staff? By non-domiciled staff, and basically, are you hiring staff from the EU? Because obviously one of the principal reasons for Brexit is to control our borders and control our immigration. Um, and from the 1st of January, we'll be moving to a points-based immigration system, both for, both for inside the EU and also some amendments to outside the EU as well. Um, it is an employer's responsibility um, to comply with that points-based immigration system, you will need to sponsor employees coming in. And, the, you know, there's quite serious implications if you don't do that. So if you are reliant on overseas labour, wherever it comes from, well, you know, that, that is something that, you know, you, you should spend time looking at now because it will take some time to process those immigration applications. Another point, if you access EU funding, um, Horizon 2020, Applications last time I looked could still be made for EU funding. So if you if you would like EU funding or you think you might qualify for EU funding and Innovate UK actually comes from Horizon 2020, then that's something that you might want to look at now. But time is running now very short and that won't obviously be available post Brexit. There will be undoubtedly replacement government funding, you know, for certain schemes in due course, uh, but the EU funding is still just available. Transferring personal data at the moment, in the last couple of years, many of you will have been through the GDPR process and obviously that was a bit of a bind. Obviously, in, as no longer part of the EU, we'll, we'll not be subject to GDPR anymore, but that may have implications for what data you're holding in respect of individuals in Europe. So, <clears throat> big question, do you need to update your GDPR and data protection policies or data consents? Further point, I'm coming back to something I was saying about earlier about tenders and products. Some companies are coming to the conclusion that they need an EU based subsidiary to enable them to continue trading in Europe. And, you know, that, that, that is something a lot, a, lot, a lot of groups and a lot of companies do. But if you haven't set up a company in the EU before or in, in an overseas territory before, please do appreciate that <clears throat> the, the rules elsewhere for establishing a corporate and operating that corporate are not like the UK rules. So in the UK, it's relatively easy to buy a company off the shelf. The lawyers have done a great job at streamlining that to enable that to be done. It can take some months 
to set up a company in an overseas territory. It will have bespoke articles. It may, may need to be notarized. Um, bank accounts again are taking longer than ever to set up because of the old regulation around setting up a new bank account. And um, so these processes do take time. And of course, once that's set up, that will be subject to overseas regulations, not Euro, not UK regulations. So different tax regulations, different filing obligations, different rates of tax, and different accounting regulations. When you draw up accounts, who you file accounts with. So a whole a whole sort of different basis. And you know, if you do want to set up, I feel you may need to set up an overseas subsidiary or an overseas branch for that matter. Do speak to us sooner rather than later, uh, because I say that process can take some time. <clears throat> Final point I want to make is in respect of um, interest royalties and dividends. So if you if you're part of a multinational group or you have um, funding from overseas or you or you fund something else overseas, intellectual property um, or dividends moving back and forward. Within the EU at the moment, we benefit from the what's called the interest and royalties directive and the free movement of capital directive. And what those do is effectively eliminate taxes in respect of the payment of interest royalties and dividends between EU member states to facilitate you know, ease of trade. We will not be part of those directives next year. What replaces them? Well, outside of the EU directives, the UK, as in common with many countries, has a series of bilateral treaties, the double tax treaties with overseas territories that can <clears throat> that can reduce or eliminate withholding taxes on interest royalties and uh, dividends. However, those are not automatic. You do have to apply for them in respect of each stream. So if you have flows of interest, dividends or royalties with respect to EU affiliates, dividends coming into the UK, uh, interest and royalties passing back and forwards, then please do look at those quite closely as soon as possible. And if you're not certain that you, you you will benefit from a treaty and have applied and 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 have that have that application approved to benefit from treaty rates in the new year, um, then it's, please do speak to us before making payments of uh, payments of those, because it is the payment point that triggers the the withholding tax, and it, it, that that is enforced by HMRC certainly and by you know the tax authorities of other countries. Okay, next slide. So just a few questions there again, again for you to think about based on, on the previous slide. And I think that's back to Alistair. Thank you all. Thank you to all the speakers. Um, and just as a very, very quick roundup then, Sam, if we can just move on to effectively what's my roundup slide. So hopefully all of the people on the presentation today, everybody who's attending, um, they will have heard that one of our key actions is for businesses to look at whether or not they have in place the basic housekeeping such as the right EORI numbers or they have checked their contractual terms, their INCO terms with their customers, with their suppliers, looking to see what impact could apply from the 1st of January. Look at things like labelling. Um, now that's becoming a big issue with places like Northern Ireland. It will also become a bigger issue as we diverge from the EU over time. Um, look and see, can you quantify the costs of the new requirements where you face an extra administration? And to just to try and put it in context, export or customs declarations at the moment in the UK, there are normally about 55 million a year done. Under Brexit, we will end up with more than 250 million being done a year and each one of those typically costs 30 pounds. Now that is a business cost that is going to be passed either to the businesses or to the customers. So there are going to be costs, there are going to be significant costs and you need to understand where those will fit. Assess either your Northern Ireland sales or your EU sales and understand what friction is going to be arising as a result of this. In some markets, the ongoing trade, you might assess it to be unviable. We've already had clients who have said that they will not deal with certain jurisdictions for a period of months whilst this all settles down, and they may never go back to dealing with those markets full stop. And if you haven't, we suggest you look at this as a matter of urgency. 
And that, if we can move on to the next slide, Sam, um, in reality, that brings this particular presentation to an end. However, we have had some questions that have been posed in advance. We have also had a question come up um, on the chat function. Now, I mean, because there is one question that's come up on the chat function, I'll, I'm just going to read it out and then I was going to say, I mean, Hadeem, would you be able to see if you can answer this one? But the, so the question that's come up is how frequently will customs tariffs change? So is it something that tariffs would change on a transaction by transaction basis or do tariffs tend to stay the same? Uh, tariffs tend to stay fairly regular for a period of time. So this is like general tariffs. The reason they, they're in place is to try and protect UK businesses or the EU wants to protect EU businesses. So they, they will change if, for instance, they're finding there are cheap imports kind of distort the UK market. So generally they'll tend to change for kind of protectionist purposes, but broadly they'll they will stay the same for a period of time because the UK will want to kind of give some sort of clarity and consistency to businesses so uncertainty. So I don't envisage them changing greatly straight away, but once we start getting into kind of agreeing new trade deals with other countries, or for instance, if we're finding we're no longer being competitive in a particular area, then we will see changes in particular areas rather than a, a wholesale change. And I suppose to echo your point about them being used as a way to affect trade, um, certainly in the press in the last week or so, there have been changes announced by the EU in relation to Boeing, um, and that's in relation to I suppose the US being anti-competitive, but the, the changes that were announced were in relation to tariffs. So they are something that can be changed to try and affect trade deliberately. Um, I mean, one thing that UK has done, so with the UK global tariff, they've got rid of some of the sm small tariffs, so something like the 1% or the 2%. They've got rid of those nuisance tariffs. So that's a bonus for a number of businesses. But what they've also tried to do is they've tried to look at the UK economy and what the manufacturing industry in the UK needs in terms of component parts. So they've tried to liberalise a lot of those codes to try and give UK manufacturing a boost. So if kind of there are other things that come in, I think the UK will try and be proactively proactively manage manufacturing and it'll look like look to assist where it can. Oh, that's the certainly the messages we're getting. Thanks, Adeem. And Angela, just you'd mentioned the margin scheme in your presentation. Um, I mean, in terms of what's happening with Northern Ireland, but you were suggesting that it would impact upon the margin scheme. It would. It, um, it will. It will affect businesses in Northern Ireland. So businesses in GB can continue to use the margin scheme as they have been doing. And in fact, if they buy a product from Northern Ireland under the margin scheme, they can take it back um, across the water and sell it again using the margin scheme. Whereas businesses in Northern Ireland, if we, uh, and, and I'll use cars as the example. So if a, if a garage here buys a car under the margin scheme from a garage in GB, um, and they bring it back to Northern Ireland for sale in Northern Ireland, they can then not use the margin scheme to sell it. So they'll have to charge a full, the full standard 20% VAT rate on it, um, which is going to make our cars significantly more expensive going forward. Um, on, it's unlike, and again, it's unlikely that there'll be a relief for that because that those rules will follow. The reason for that is that Northern Ireland has to follow the EU rules. Um, and, and following EU rules, we see GB as a third country, um, so um, it's, it's unlikely that there'll be any relief. And so that would be a big impact for anybody who wants to buy a second hand car in Northern Ireland. <coughs> <coughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, on, on that, yes, it, it will be. Um, the alternative is to look for other markets, but I believe that cars are, are actually more expensive in, in Ireland, for example. So I, th I think it'll be the consumer that suffers. So, so if there was a takeaway, if you're in the market for a second hand car, get it before the end of the year then? Possibly, possibly, yes. <laughs> um, but in, in terms of so the third question on this slide, I actually quite like is that how long could goods be delayed for if the correct procedures have not been followed? The answer is until you fix the procedure that you haven't followed, I think, and you know, without being too flippant about it, it's it will be the business that will be able to unlock the friction in that case. It'll be the business that 
hasn't carried out a step that should have been carried out and it'll be the, up to the business then to carry out the step that needs to be carried out to unlock that particular shipment that is delayed. Um, and that's one of the key messages with all of this. This is something that businesses need to put in, in place a series of processes to, to make sure that their goods aren't delayed. Um, hopefully the fourth question, hopefully the submitter of that fourth question has been able to take away a lot from this particular presentation. And I'll just move on to the next slide because it's got the final questions that we had or some of the final questions that we had. We will have had some others submitted today that we will get answers to the submitters directly. Um, I'll answer the one about technology solutions. Um, I suppose we're seeing a lot of clients going to um, either customs agents as being the quickest way to deal with this, or they're upgrading or they're buying software that will enable them to do it themselves. Hadim covered the point about the, uh, I suppose, the training that the UK government are funding. Um, now that might mean that businesses can have their own in-house team, or it might mean that they've got just an upgrade to existing software. Um, the answer as to what you should do, unfortunately, will depend on your business and where your state of readiness is already. Um, but on the at the very end of these slides, there is a table of links that does include a link to the UK government's list of customs agents. Um, these are people who are registered with the UK government. Um, that's quite a long list. You can search by, for example, telephone number, so you'll be able to find somebody who's in your region. And the quickest answer might be to engage with somebody like that. But in reality, equally, there might be a lot of people who are trying to engage with that type of agent. So you might find that they've got capacity issues. So again, acting sooner rather than later. Um, so I'd say our, our final point on this, and I, it's just to go back to Angela on this as our final comment. Angela, just, you know, question five, just to reiterate the point yeah. on question five. Yeah. Goods, from, goods to and from Northern Ireland. OK, so goods to and from Northern Ireland. So the, um, will all goods from GB to ENI require an export and import declaration? There's only there's one declaration. So unlike goods going from UK to EU, where you will effectively have an, a, an export declaration and a separate import declaration, there will be just be one customs declaration um, and it will be done in a different format and TSS will do it for you if you're registered with them and at any time and you have provided the information that they need. Um, we understand that they will work with both the GB exporter and the NI importer. Um, the NI importer will either be the business in Northern Ireland or the GB exporter, depending again on the equal terms and, and how they arrange that transaction. But TSS will liaise with both parties to complete that declaration. But the the real key message with that, the, the TSS service, there's a link to it at the end of this presentation again, but the, the TSS service is up and running, get registered, they will help, but you need to register. And they were saying on Newsnight earlier this week that only 40% of the number of businesses that they were expecting to have registered have in fact registered. So yeah. Um, I think I th absolutely the takeaway, the takeaway certainly for all Northern Ireland businesses um, and GB businesses is register for TSS. Um, I think Northern Ireland businesses have been much more engaged. We don't have the issues um, that 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 Hideem and Alistair have gone through in terms of um, training with the EU. So that has been our primary focus. Obviously, GB businesses have been focusing on how they trade with the EU going forward and perhaps not so aware of the changes that they need to make to trade with Northern Ireland. One of the things that the TSS asks for and asks Northern Ireland businesses for when they register um, are the names and details of their GB suppliers. I think the view there is that they are hoping to contact the GB suppliers directly to ask them to register. But certainly you know, my key point of this is to, to raise awareness of TSS and get as many businesses registered for it as possible. And thank you very much. And Sam, if you can just move on to the slide that's got the links in it. Um, at this point, these slides will be available to anybody who's been signed up for the webinar today. We'll bring the webinar to a close at, at this point because we're heading towards the end of the hour. Um, but thank you all very much for attending. Hopefully that's been, uh, I suppose, a quick tour of everything that you should be thinking about. If any of you need assistance, whether it's assistance in Northern Ireland or it's assistance here in North of England, please do feel free to contact us. We'd be delighted to talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis because every business is different. 
But thank you all very much for participating in this webinar today. Thank you.